Praise the Lord. We'll rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for our Bible study today. Thank you because you always teach us practical things that affect our lives and they speak to our relationships with you and with one another. I pray, Lord, tonight you breathe and your word for every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. And we ask you, oh Lord, you open our spiritual eyes to see. So we'll understand where we are and realize what you demand, what you require in our lives. And then be able to have the grace, the strength to do what you call us to do and to be. The kind of believer and disciple of Christ we ought to be. That your grace will be abundant in every one of our lives in Jesus name. That Lord we come, we come with our hearts a soul and a spirit, a mind, where the totality of our personality will come and we're willing to receive your word even tonight. Lord, we pray in those areas where we have been blindfolded and we have not seen what you have seen in our lives. We pray, Lord, you remove the bandage even tonight in Jesus' name. And help us, Lord, that we, as we discover will bring everything to the cross of Calvary and the blood of the Lamb, the cleansing blood, the sanctifying blood, the purging, purifying blood, the redeeming, ransoming blood will be applied to every heart, even tonight in Jesus' name. And our lives will be pleasing unto you. Do something very definite in every heart today. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. For those who are coming here for the first time, and those who are attending our Bible studies in all the various locations all over this nation, Nigeria, and in the various locations in Africa and beyond Africa, I welcome every one of you tonight in Jesus' name. And for those who will be listening over the satellite or internet rather, after this time, I want to tell you that if you're living just on your own and you're listening to the Bible study by yourself, I pray God will give you the discipline to be able to stray through. Because, you know, if you listen to a part of the word and then you get up, go to do other things and then come back, you actually miss the very pungent points the Lord wants to reveal to you. And tonight, as we come to this word, those of us who are here and those of us who are gathered together in the various locations where we are, you come with your mind, with your brain, with your intellect, and you think through as we look at the word of God tonight, by the way, we're just looking at two verses of scripture. If I will not be able to finish the two verses of scripture, and we're going to continue next Monday with verse 22 of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 21 and verse 22. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raker, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire as we look at those words of scripture you want to remember that jesus christ has been talking about righteousness the righteousness of the kingdom the righteousness that comes by grace through faith the righteousness that is imputed unto us and the righteousness that is imparted unto us. The righteousness that shows that we have met the Lord Jesus Christ. We have become his followers. And then something has happened in our hearts, in our lives. And has then affected our relationship with God and with our fellow men. It has affected our family relationship. 
It has affected our relationship with our neighbors. It has affected the relationship between employers and employees. It has affected the relationship between shepherd and sheep. It has affected the relationship between the master and the disciple. And the Lord, not Jesus Christ, he wants to go into the practical areas of this relationship. But you'll find that he says this, he comes with authority. The authority of a teacher come from heaven. And the authority of the man that is sent from the almighty God to give us the light. The true light that shows the light and beams the light on the pathway of all men here on earth. He comes with the authority of the king. Because in Matthew we have the king revealed to the children of Israel. You remember when those people came from this, they said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And here Jesus Christ, in his royalty, in his sovereignty, as a king, he says, This is what you had before, but I, the king, I say unto you. He comes as the judge, the final judge of heaven and earth. Because he said, the father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment into the hand of the son. And here he comes then with the finality and the authority of a judge. He said, this is what you heard in the past, but I, the judge, I say unto you. You'll discover that here it says this six times over. Look at verse 21 and verse 22. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. Verse 22, but I say unto you, This is what you heard in the past, and this is what I now declare unto you. Verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you. That's the second time. You see, it comes with authority. And it comes with finality as well. It tells us in verse, in verse 31, It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, Let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, save him for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. He never heard anything like that before. This is the divine teacher. This is the exalted son of man, son of God. This is the exalted king with royalty and sovereignty. This is the judge of the whole earth. And then he continues for the fourth time now in verse 33 again. Ye have heard that it has been said by them of all time. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform to the Lord thine oath. But I say unto you, swear not at all. This is the one that is greater than Moses, greater than Aaron. Greater than the prophets of old and greater than the angels in heaven. And it comes with this final authority, but I say unto you. And then in verse 38, ye have heard that it has been said, and an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that she receives not evil. And then in verse 43, ye have heard, it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and shall hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Can you see the authority with which he spoke? And then when he finished in chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 28 and verse 29. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. That's why we commented in that area, in that place that Jesus teaches about the practice and the principles of the kingdom. And this is the kingdom of God that must accommodate righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And then he comes with this final authority saying, this is what I said unto you. Now let's come back to Matthew chapter 5 verse 21. You have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. 
The interpretation of the Pharisees and the religious leaders was so limited and inadequate. It is thought once you do not kill literally, directly, you see neither a machine gun or you are using the Dane gun or you are using a rifle or you are using a machete. You are not using any instrument to kill anybody. They thought they were free until Christ began to tell them that the commandment of God is broad, is deep, and is high. Those uh, people, I mean those uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, they have not understood, maybe they have not read, they have not thought about Psalm 119 verse 96. Psalm 119 verse 96. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Thy commandment is wide. That commandment is deep. That commandment in its ramification, in its application, is very, very broad. But you see, the Pharisees and the scribes, they had narrowed it down. And this is what they have heard. Thou shalt not kill. And then if you kill, you become guilty. And then they'll ask one another, are you guilty of that? So they say no. And then you ask the other fellow, are you guilty of that? And they said, no. Then we are righteous, aren't we? And they said, yes, they were righteous until Christ came. And then he began to open their eyes to the meaning and the depth of scripture. That the commandment of God thou shalt not kill is much more than just the literal killing. And then he began to tell them, but I say unto you, that whosoever, but I say unto you, that whosoever, think about that, whosoever, Pharisee, whosoever, the scribe, whosoever, the lawyers and the doctors of the law, that whosoever, the members of the Sanhedrin, whosoever, the leaders, of the Jewish community, Nicodemus, that whosoever, if you bring it back today, the bishop and the pastor, the overseer and the superintendent, the men and the women, the members of the church and the workers of the church, that Jesus Christ brought his word and then he said, whosoever, the husband or the wife, the child or the father, the mother, the maid, the servant, the employer, the employee, that whosoever is angry. Think about that. As you look at the volume, uh, let me use that word, the volume of anger in the world. As you look at the height, the compilation, the accumulation of anger in the world, anger in the church, anger in the world, Anger in the office, anger in the school, anger in the village, anger in the city, anger in the country. And Jesus said that whosoever is angry, and anger, anger is everywhere, it's on every street, it's in every community, and it's everywhere. It's among those who are even in courtship that should be smiling together. It's even among those who are having honeymoon. The people that should just be tasting honey, just happy and smiling, there is anger. Anger is everywhere. Anger is on the throne. Anger is on the ground. Anger is with the rich. Anger is with the poor. Anger is with the jobless. Anger is with the employed. And Jesus Christ said, Whosoever is angry with his brother, that means his neighbor, that means anybody you have contact with, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, thou fool. As, uh, as young as we are, I'm sure you've heard people saying that before. Even mothers saying that to their children. Thou fool. 
And people on the street, strangers, saying that to just a stranger they never met. They get angry. Thou fool. And teachers saying that to the children, to the students. Thou fool. And even the students saying it to the principal. Thou fool. And members of the church saying it to one another. Thou fool. And people, you know, the, when you're on, on that motorcycle and, you know, the fellow wants to ask you for the money. And then he, he measures an amount you seek. How can that be? This is just motorcycle. This is not a taxi. And then you have exchange of words. Thou fool. We hear it almost everywhere. And it's like nothing. And Jesus said, whosoever is angry with his brother, with his neighbor. And he gets so worked up and stirred up and gets so angry and the fire of madness. Anger is short madness. And that fire of madness come up to his throat and to his tongue and he says, thou fool. He says, whosoever shall say, thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. If it is so serious like this, we need to talk about it. We need to think about it. We need to learn about it. We need to see what Christ has said. And remember, this is the final judge. And remember, when we leave this world and we go to the great beyond, this is the one that is going to judge us. And the standard by which he's going to judge us is what is laying down principle upon principle precept upon precept and therefore we need to be wise and think about our future and think about our eternity and think about the words that jesus christ is giving to us i pray we'll open our eyes you see we've been going along almost like the pharisees and the sadducees we've been carrying the bible thou shalt not kill praise the lord i never killed in my life but it's more than that the lord wants to get us out of that superficial interpretation of the word of god and get into the depths of the word of god so we'll realize how much of the blood of the lamb will still need to cleanse us and wash us and purge us and prepare us for the coming of the lord we're dividing the message to three parts tonight number one specific sin condemned by god the specific sin in a passage of today that is condemned by the by god and then point number two the spiritual standard confirmed by christ the spiritual standard confirmed by christ number three saved souls controlled by the spirit point one for the father point two for the son Point three, for the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We have the specific sin condemned by God the Father. And then we have the spiritual standard that uh, is confirmed by Christ the Son. And then saved souls that are now under the control of the Holy Spirit. We come to number one, the specific sin condemned by God. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 21. Matthew 5 verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. How old is old time? More than 2,000 years. More than 2,000 and 500 years more than 4,000 years since the time of Adam thou shalt not kill time does not cancel God's commandment dispensation age period era epoch does not cancel the commandment of God civilization one period of time passing, another period of time coming does not cancel, erase, or weaken the commandments of God. 
We need to say that because there are some people that will say, yes, we used to believe that 30 years ago. Now this is 30 years after. After 30 years, are we still believing the same thing? 30 years, that is nothing. After 2,000 years, 2,500 years, after 4,000 years, it's still there. You have heard it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Exodus chapter 20 verse 13. Exodus chapter 20. We're reading from verse 13. Here we have the commandment of the Lord. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. It's a message that is coming to you directly. Don't ask about other people. Everybody will answer for himself. How about so and so? Leave me alone. How about you? Everyone will answer for himself. Thou shalt not kill kill actually that commandment you'll find in exodus had been there before exodus in genesis chapter 9 genesis chapter 9 i'm reading to you from verse 5 and verse 6 genesis chapter 9 reading from verse 8 verse 5 and surely your blood of your lives will i require at the end of every beast will i require it have you ever thought about that even an animal, if an animal kills a man, God says, I have a way of requiring the blood of a man from that beast, from that animal. I have a way of bringing punishment on that animal. Think about that. That this commandment is so serious that the Lord even extends it to an animal and said, the blood, your blood will I require at the hand of the beast, every beast will I require each. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Verse 6, so, so sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Can you see what the Lord is telling us? Right from Genesis, thou shalt not kill. The word of God has always been there. And then the people, the children of Israel, they began to have explanation. You see, the Lord did not just say, thou shalt not kill and stop there. He gave them explanation of what the commandment implied. Exodus chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 12. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. You see the explanation. He that smiteth a man and something had happened and then violence erupted. If the people of the world, if they knew the commandments of God, they'll become more careful with life, precious life. And they'll seek of the sanctity of life and the, how precious life is. And they will know that God created man in his image. And he has said he is the only one that has the right to stop that life from existing here on earth. And so he said anyone who kills another man, he shall surely be put to death. But now look at verse 13. God, this God is so wonderful. He explained to the people, he said, But and if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, and then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. That's talking about accident. If a man is not waiting for another one, there was no quarrel. There was no fighting. There was no contention. There was no conflict. There was no disagreement. There was nothing they were arguing about or fighting on. But accidentally, this fellow became killed as a result of, you know, something happening between them. Then the Lord said, that's different. 
That's not deliberate. Although the other fellow has died, it is not coming out of malice. It's not coming out of strife. He said, therefore, I will appoint a place. They called it in the Old Testament. A place, a city of refuge. The slayer, the killer, the murderer will run there. And then in that place, he will be protected. And, but immediately, he goes on to verse 14. You see, when, when the Lord gives that window of uh, grace, that window of liberty, and that window of freedom, there are many people that then will say, okay, I did it accidentally. Then he went back to verse 14. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. If a person killed another fellow, and then he wants to be religious after he has manifested that kind of violence. And then he runs to the altar, holding on to the altar. I'm depending upon the mercy. He says, take him out of that altar, kill him. And let the law have its way. You see how serious it is that the Lord is saying, thou shalt not kill. Well, let's ask some few questions. How about abortion? How about the people that commit abortion? There's pregnancy. And a child is conceived. Is that child just tissue? Is that child just muscles? Does that child have life? Do we have the liberty to just take the life of that child? And say, after all, the child is not born yet. Can anybody be held guilty, responsible for abortion? Well, we, we, must, we must find out what does God think about the child that is still inside. Does God count that child inside as a real living entity? Or is it just nothing like an object? Look at Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. We're reading from verse 21. Genesis chapter 25 verse 21. Here we're told, And I seek and treated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord entreated, was entreated of him. And Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her. They were not born yet. They struggled within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? Why am I having so much trouble with this pregnancy? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said, two nations are in thy womb. He counted them already as living, living beings. Not only that, he even looked at the future already. Not only that, he even saw that nations will come out of them already. Anybody killing those children while they're still inside, you're not just killing only one man, you're killing nations. People don't understand. And he said, it's just, you know, I'm having some difficulty with this pregnancy. And with this kind of trouble and difficulty, I think I need to go to the abortionist to help me terminate the pregnancy. You are terminating a whole nation. And so God said, two nations are going to come out of the twins that you have. Now, maybe you don't know about the pregnancy, about the twins now through prophecy, but you know through scanning. And then you go to the doctor, you go to the clinic, and they say, well, we are not prophets, we are doctors. And the prophet will know it directly by revelation, but we will know it by x-ray. Therefore, go for scan. And then they tell you, ah, two babies are inside there. And you say, but I cannot sleep at night. Not only I cannot sleep at night, not only the pregnancy, but even the thought of having twins at this time. The ones we have got, we don't have money to take care of them. And if these ones come, 
How are we going to have money to take care of them? Doctor, can you help me? If you're a Christian, doctor will say no. Don't get me involved in the judgment of God. Fiery judgment. Indignation. Wrath of God. No, you cannot help us. Can you help me? No, I cannot help you to commit sin. To commit murder. Because abortion is murder. Two nations are inside thee in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other. And the elder shall serve the younger. The Lord was already planning for them. And if you kill them, then you terminate the plan of God. Look at Isaiah chapter 48. God knows them and recognizes them before they are ever born. Don't kill them. In Isaiah chapter 48, I'm reading from verse 8. Isaiah 48 verse 8. Yea, thou heardest not. Yea, thou knewest not. Yea, from the time when thine ear was not opened. For I knew that thou would deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. You were not even born. I already was studying and looking at your life and looking at what you will be. And you already named and called transgressor from the womb. Therefore, you will see that God already knew about those children before they are born. And therefore, if you are pregnant and you have commit, you committed adultery, you have committed murder. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him or in her. If you have committed murder, you cannot just continue and say, well, I'm still a Christian, but I'm feeling a little bit uneasy. I'm feeling a little bit unhappy for one mistake that I made. Mistake? What's a mistake? Abortion is not a mistake. Abortion is a sin. A deadly sin, a terrible sin, a sin that brings you under the fiery judgment of God. Who calls abortion a mistake? When God says, that's a life I created. And if you touch that life and killed that life, then something is wrong. You've done evil. Now, sometimes uh, the doctors will tell you and they will say, you know, this child, the way we're looking at this child is uh, when that child is born, it's going to have this problem, this problem, this problem. And then they, they say, now we, we need to discuss, let's debate it. That's what they say, but we don't debate the word of God. Can't you kill this child, have abortion for this child? Because of the peculiarity, the peculiar situation. Well, let me ask you another question. We have a lot of morals in the world. We have a lot of mad people on the streets. We have a lot of deformed people in the town. Can anybody just say now, this is a moron. And it's not useful to anybody, neither to himself or to society. This is a madman on the street. Can anybody then give an excuse and say, because this is a moron, this is a madman, then take a machete and kill them off? They'll arrest him. And he has committed murder. If you cannot kill the one that is alive here, and you are not permitted to commit murder because this one has this problem. The one inside, you cannot touch, you cannot kill. Abortion is sin. Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet on the, unto the nation. When you commit abortion, you might be killing a prophet. You might be killing a president. You might be killing somebody. 
that God has assigned a great work, has given a great assignment to. That's why you will not touch that pregnancy because the Bible says, Thou shalt not kill. You know, sometimes when you read about some of these great men in the world, and you read about what their parents would have done to them when they were much, much younger, even after they were born. If you read the papers last week, there's somebody that is well known in this nation. His picture appears almost every time in the newspaper. You see, he was very, very sick and sickly when he was very young. And the mother became fed up with him. That this one, why keep this one alive? And so they were in the boat. And they were sailing on the sea. A deep river. All of a sudden, the mother took the child, fed up with that child. Because of sickness. And threw that child into the river. Let him die. And then she herself wanted to jump into the river. And eventually, uh, the people there, they grabbed her. They didn't allow her to jump into the river. Then they were looking at where the child dropped eventually. And then it appears the child will not even surface on the sea. But eventually they dived into the river and they got the boy, rescued the boy. And that right now, that boy has become a man a great man in society think about that the people that you thought there's no use keeping these alive how do you know you see here jeremiah was told before you were born while you were still in the belly i knew the, i knew you and i ordained you a prophet unto the nations let's look at luke chapter one Luke chapter 1. This is the reason why you take the commandment of the Lord serious. Thou shalt not kill. You will not kill an infant. You will not kill by deliberate neglect. Neither will you kill by deliberate murderous action. By neglect, what that means is, you might say, all right, I'm not going to touch the child. But you don't feed the child. And you don't give any care to the child. And you kill the child by deliberate neglect. You cannot do that. If you do that, God knows your heart. He knows what you have done. Neither will you kill with poison. Or kill in, with any other means. Thou shalt not kill. Luke chapter 1. Reading from verse 41. In Luke chapter 1 verse 41. And it came to pass. That when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary. The babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's why you cannot commit abortion. Because that child became even conscious of the presence of Mary the Virgin. The mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Elizabeth said, when the child heard the voice of your son. When Elizabeth heard the voice of your salutation. The baby leaped in my womb. Look at verse 44. For lo, as soon as the voice of salutation sounded in my ears. The baby leaped in my womb for joy. Thou shalt not kill. By the way, that commandment of God that we have read in the Old Testament. Thou shalt not kill. Was repeated in the New Testament. Which means that the new covenant has not abolished that commandment of God. Civilization, enlightenment has not erased that commandment of God from the word of God. Hey, look at the New Testament, now Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 19, verse 18. He says unto him, which Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. That's saying, Don't be a murderer. Don't kill. Romans chapter 1, we're reading from verse 29. Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 29. 
being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder. It says murder in the New Testament is unrighteousness. What's the result of that? Verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. In the New Testament, they that do such things, killing others, committing abortion, they that do such things are worthy of death. And look at verse uh, uh, that verse 32 it says not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them not only that they do it alone they have pleasure they encourage those who do them that means then that's a terrible sin then let us look at galatians chapter 5 verse 21 galatians 5 verse 21 Envies mothers. Envies mothers. What's going to happen to them? That verse 21, the latter part, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. No matter how, how hypocritical you are, and you are pretending to be religious, and you are killing. If you're killing, if you're a murderer, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. God, First John, chapter three, verse fifteen. In First John, chapter three, reading from verse fifteen, here it says, "Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer." And ye you know, you ought to know. New Testament believers, ye you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Ye you know. That no murderer has eternal life abiding with him or in him. Before I leave point one, I want to consider another area of killing of murder. We're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel. Here we see what, uh, what happened between David and Uriah. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're reading from verse 14. 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 14. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the end of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die here is another another area of killing that david did not do that himself directly and david just wrote in the letter he was a man of authority and he used his authority to make use of another person to carry out the murder and then he said put him in the hottest part of the battle and then withdraw from him and Job, don't touch him yourself. Just search the trap. Just search the situation. And then the situation will take care of itself. And then he will be killed. Then we're told in verse, we're told in verse 16. And it came to pass when Job observed the city. That he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were and the men of the city went out and fought with Joab and there fell some of the people of the servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also David was not there but he was at the background you call it remote control he controlled the action of Joab he controlled everything that happened. Although he was not there, he orchestrated everything until Uriah died. How did God view that? How did God see that? Second Samuel chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 9. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 9. 
Wherefore, as thou despise the commandment of the Lord to do, to do evil in his sight, thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite of the sun. Nathan was talking to David. He said, David, you've done it. It's you. The guilt, the condemnation, the judgment is at your doorstep. And the fiery indignation of God, David, is on you. You did it. And you killed Uriah with the sword. And he never held the sword himself. Are you learning a lesson? Is if you stay far away. And then you counsel people. You control people. And you tell them to do evil. You command them to do evil. You encourage them to do evil. When they have done the evil and then you are back there at the back of the fence and you said, I am not involved. You are guilty. You are under the wrath of God. The sin you encourage other people to commit. The sin you influence other people to commit. The sin you counsel other people to commit. You are regarded as the sinner as well. And the judgment of God is upon you. Verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. And so you see then the commandment of the Lord. Thou shalt not kill. And if you have been involved in any way you need to Plead before the Lord that the Lord will forgive you whether you've done it directly or you have encouraged other people to do it then you must seek for the forgiveness of God until you are totally free we we'll come back to Matthew chapter 5 I'm reading from now verse 22 spiritual standard confirmed by Christ you see those Pharisees their interpretation was limited their understanding of the commandment of God was limited. And because of the limitation of their understanding, they felt they were free. The guilty one thought he was godly. And that's what happens whenever our understanding of the word of God is very shallow. Shallow interpretation of the word, superficial interpretation of the word is very deceptive. It's very dangerous. And it's deadly. And it damns the souls of men. But Christ came to give us the full revelation of God's mind. He came to reveal the standard interpretation by which all men shall be judged. When they stand before the impartial judge of heaven and earth. Matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 22. But I say unto you. I say unto you. He is the eternal one. And he's speaking the eternal word unto us. Is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? And what he said before, he's still saying the same thing today. But I say unto you that whosoever. Have, have you noticed that the Lord Jesus Christ, he represented the mind of God without fear, without favor. In fact, uh, you know, sometimes uh, when we're preaching and we mention this false doctrine and then we mention the false teachers and false prophets and the churches associated with that, that false doctrine, people say, why do you do that? What if their members are in the church and their members will hear what you are saying? That's exactly how Jesus did it. He called the Pharisees by name. He called the scribes by name. And then he told the people, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes. And the Pharisees were there in the audience. And the disciples of the Pharisees were there in the audience. If you really want to rescue souls, you cannot cover your mouth and say what you are saying. You have to open wide your mouth and let everybody understand what you are talking about. And so Jesus said, whosoever, Pharisees, Sadducees, Christ included, the rulers of the Jews included, the religious men and women included, and his disciples included, whosoever, is angry 
with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. The, the question is why? Why did Jesus put such a weight on anger? Because of what anger actually leads to. And let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. To the, to the beginning of time. In Genesis chapter 4, reading from verse 5. But unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very lost. That's anger. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, Cain? Why are you angry? And why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Anger led to murder. That's why Jesus said, you have heard, it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, don't even allow the temper, the smoke, the fire in the heart that will lead to the action. That if you are angry with your brother without a cause, you are going to be in the danger of Hell fire Genesis chapter Genesis chapter 49 Genesis chapter 49 I'm reading from verse 5 Simeon and Levi are brethren instruments of cruelty in their habitations oh my soul come not into their secret unto their assembly mine honor be not thou united for in their anger they slew a man in their anger they slew a man and in their self-will they dig down a wall cause it be their anger for it was fierce and their wrath for it was cruel i will divide them in jacob and scatter them in israel you see what anger leads to? And what had happened is the people of Shechem had defiled Dinah, their sister. And because of that, they got angry. Two wrongs will not make a right. Shechem had done something wrong. That's true. But you getting angry and then killing him and deceiving the whole city and killing all the people there, two wrongs will not make a right. And it says they were cruel. They murdered all those people. And you see that they even went beyond just the individual that defiled Dinah. They killed everybody in that community because of the anger. Is uh, you know, even if they killed Shechem alone, that would have been wrong. But they killed all the people that didn't have any hand in the sin that Shechem committed. That's what anger does. Anger does not know limitation, anger does not have boundary, anger does not have perimeter. When that thing comes up, it blindfolds you, and the smoke will just shut out your sight, your vision, and then you just go on rampage, rage will lead to a lot of other things that are unreasonable. That's why Jesus said, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And then if the anger continues, we are going to say it out, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And whosoever shall say, Reka shall be in the danger of the council and then it's not going to stop there the anger is going to keep on foaming and expanding and getting higher and higher and whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire and that's what the lord that's why the lord is saying get rid of it before it even gets started look at esther chapter 3 esther chapter 3 you understand then what the Lord is saying? Get rid of the anger. Don't even allow it to come up at all. 
Esther chapter 3. We're looking at verse 5 and verse 6. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. This is a simple matter. Um, Haman was uh, like the second to the king. And then he was going to visit the king. And there were a lot of people there, the servants of the king. And only one man, only one Mordecai did not bow. All the others bowed. But Haman did not see the respect and the honor of the other people. Only one person that did not bow that bothered him. And he got angry. And he lost his cool. And then he now began to plan. What was he going to do? Look at verse 6. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. Can you see that? Just anger with one man. Made Haman to say, I'm going to search out all the people that belong to, to Mordecai. Anyone related to Mordecai in any way. Not even the same family. Not even the same tribe. The same nation. All the people of the Jews. I'm going to destroy them. Anger leads to atrocities, murder, terrible things. You know when you get angry, a lot of things you do, you regret later. Why don't you just sit back and stop and think? If you allow this tide, this wave, this storm within you to carry you downstream, by the time you get downstream, all the things that will have happened, you know, can ruin the whole of your life. And so he, man, were told, he said, I'm going to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. That's why the Lord is telling us, get rid of it. Get rid of it. And let's look at um, Proverbs Chapter 27. In Proverbs chapter 27, verses 3 and 4. His stone is heavy. If you've carried one before, you know. And the sand witchy. But a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. A fool's wrath, anger, is heavier than them both. You understand the meaning of that? And what, what it's saying is, if there's a little child, and you put a stone on that child, that is heavy. Or if you put um, a pail of sand, or you put a bucket of sand on that child, that is heavy. In fact, it can be so heavy to crush the child to death. But then it says, a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. The decisions fathers take when they are angry. The decision husbands take when they are angry. The decision employers take when they are angry. The decision wives take when they are angry. And the decisions employees take when they are angry. They don't have any other job yet. And there is no, there is no way they can pay their house rent or feed themselves. But they get angry with the employer. And the decision they take when they are angry will make their family to be crushed. Is starvation and hunger. A fool's wrath is heavier than them both. The decision a driver takes when he's angry, when he begins to fume, and then the eyes become red, and then he forgets the signal, the sign on the road, the accidents that happen when drivers get angry. A fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Wrath is cruel in verse 4. 
and anger is outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24, verse 25. Proverbs chapter 22, reading from verse 24. Make no friendship with an angry man. I'll read the rest later, but please pay attention. Can you look up here? Make no friendship with an angry man. Let's say you are in courtship. You have not married yet. And the man, just, you're just discussing something simple. Taking a decision. And the man gets angry. And then walks away. Brother, where are you going? Come back now. What's the matter? Brother, okay, I'm sorry. Is it because of this thing with this? Okay, come back, I'm sorry. I will draw my word. And the man is angry. And he goes away. Just leaves you lady there. And then you're pleading with people. Go and beg him so he can come back. Thank God he showed his temper when you can still walk away. Make no friendship with an angry man. You are still in courtship and the fellow is slapping you and beating you during courtship. And there you are saying, well, it's the will of God. It's the will of God. I'll be waiting for you here for real counseling. you calm. And I'll see those tears, hot tears on your eyes, pastor. The man, we're married in the church and the man is beating me every week. You knew it before you got married. Make no friendship with an angry man. And you see there are some people, they get into business partnership with an angry man. The fellow is fire, is a lion. A little thing we're discussing. Okay, can we do it this way? Are you talking like that? You talk like a fool. You have never known about business before. That's what we're saying. You only know Bible. And the fellow is angry. Why don't you just cut the business and say bye-bye? I think I'll do my business alone. I'm not going to join with you. Make no friendship with an angry man. You see, there are other people. They just have... This intimate fellowship and the fellow is hurting you. Every time you go to see him, you know, he just gets angry all over. And then you even forgot, why did I go to him? What were we discussing? And then it just spoils your day and spoils your life. And for the next few hours, you cannot think about any other thing. The picture of his angry face is what you carry about. And your life is going down the drain. Make no, make no fellowship, no friendship with an angry man. That's what the Lord is telling us. If you're going to get into intimate relationship, intimate contract, intimate agreement with anybody, take care of that. Make, it says, no friendship with an angry man. You know what it means? Don't have any spiritual commitment in ministry with an angry man. You know, there are some, there are some people, they call them workers. And, and we have to be very careful where we stay because they get angry very easily. Brother, why did you put that thing there? And you are the leader, you are the pastor, you are his coordinator. And the man is just like zona leader or just as fellowship leader or just like sanitation worker. And the fellow flies up and you cannot even talk to the man or to the lady. Make no spiritual commitment in ministry with an angry man, with an angry woman. Are we so much in need of workers that we just accept everybody? They're not helping the work of the ministry. They're destroying the ministry. Let them go and sit down. Let them go and settle down. And then think about going to heaven. It's not work. It's heaven. So make no, make no agreement, no fellowship. No friendship with an angry man and with a furious man, thou shalt not go. 
you want to introduce the man to your father and your mother. What are you going to do, sir? We're going for introduction. And then you, you know, that day you said, okay, let us meet at 8 o'clock. And then you have an agreement with the brother that is going to take you there. And because of the hold up, you couldn't make it at 8 o'clock. And then you came 20 minutes after 8. And the man is already shivering, you know, with anger. Trembling with anger. And then you are coming and you are smiling, wanting to say, Thank you, you've been waiting for me. I'm so sorry about coming late. You know, the road was so bad today. And the man just, you know, dropped something on the ground to make a great noise. Where are you coming from at this time? And you have delayed me until this time. Look, don't you have, don't you have sense of time? And this is a fellow, you are, you are going to take your parents for introduction. Why don't you say, uh, my, you know, I don't know whether to say brother or man, whatever. Let's go back home. We cannot go to my daddy in this condition. All right, let us go now. <laughs> you know, he commands you like a military man. And then you want to go for introduction. If I were you, you know, if I was your earthly father, biological father, and you were my daughter, and if I uh, say my daughter, go back home, don't, don't bring an angry man to my house for introduction. You men, get ready to marry. If you really want to get married, all this temper will go. All this fighting will go. Because if you are fighting now at the car park, motor park while you are going for introduction what will you do when there are no people there you and I alone at home if we're not careful you might kill that woman make no friendship with an angry man that's what the bible says this is why the lord is teaching us his word and then he's telling us how we ought to be very careful and watch so that our lives will be peaceful your life will be peaceful in jesus name with a furious man, thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his way and get a snare to thy soul. May God deliver every one of us. I come to point number three. Saved souls controlled by the Spirit. Saved souls controlled by the Spirit. You see, self-effort alone will not do. Personal struggles alone against this anger and bad, hot temper will not do. The Lord wants us to be free. And how are you going to be free? Number one is realization of your state of mind. As I'm looking at this word of God, number one realization, I realize now. I thought it was a small thing, but this is a major thing. Number two is thorough confession before the Lord. That you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, this is serious. This is going to mess up my life. You cannot even keep good relationship. If this kind of turbulent spirit is there, and you cannot, you cannot be kept in a place of employment. You know some people that tell us that we should be praying for them to get a job. And then we say, didn't you have a job the other time we prayed? Yes, sir, I got a job. They terminated my appointment again. Why? Well, actually, something happened and I lost my temper. And my director said, please find your way out. And pastor, it has happened to me like that before. In fact, this is the first place they are terminating my appointment. Because I cannot bear, I don't have any shock absorber. If they tell me anything in the place of work, I fly, I fly in their face. And I don't care who they are. I will talk to them and tell them to their face. If something the thing has happened, then I will cool down. But I always lose my job after that. Number one is realization. Number two is confession. Number three is renunciation. You renounce nothing. And you pray as if you are really praying for a definite Christian experience. Lord, I renounce it. This terrible sin. Number four is consciousness of how terrible the sin of anger is. And then number five, you pray. 
saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, set me free. Lord, deal with this lion inside me. And then destroy the self, the ego, that is always wanting to retaliate or whatever. Deal with it in my life. When you pray like that, everything will change. I said everything will change. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's it. Walk in the spirit. And ye shall, and you'll not walk, you'll not have or demonstrate the works of the flesh. James chapter 3 verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. And able also to bridle the whole body. If any man offend not in word, not in word, don't express it. If somebody has done something and then all of a sudden you are taking it personally and it's getting to you, the first thing to do is just not to express it. I told you before, what you express, you impress. Once you express it, you impress it on yourself. And then it goes from there and on and on. And then we're told in Psalm 37. Psalm 37. I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 37 verse 7. Rest in the Lord. Isn't that how to just live a happy life and a contented life, a satisfactory life? And just, just rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for him. I did deny you of something, and then that thing wants to make you angry. They deny me of my right. Wait on the Lord patiently. All things work together for good. To them who are the called of God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Just seek ye the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. All the things they are trying to take away from you, if it belongs to you, it will come back. All these things will be added unto you. God who spared not his only begotten son and he gave him for us how much more will he not give us all the other things to enjoy just rest in the Lord don't worry about it take this away from me take that away from me leave it to the Lord and with them rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass cease from anger Cease from anger. Just say, this is the end. Stop it. Withdraw from it. Just put it out. Like you put the fire out. Just say, this is not part of my life anymore. I walk away from that. We call it detachment. Detach yourself from it. We are not relations or relatives anymore. I mean that temper. I mean that attitude detachment just say no no more cease from anger for sake wrath fret not thyself in any wise to do evil for evil doers shall be cut off but those that wait upon the lord they shall inherit the earth ecclesiastes chapter 7 ecclesiastes chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 8 better is the end of a sin than the beginning thereof the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. It tells us in verse 9, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Don't jump at conclusions. When something happens and it appears, why should that happen? Say, so, okay, I'll deal with that tomorrow. I'll think about it tomorrow. Before tomorrow comes, we'll have more information about that thing that happened. Just, just learn to postpone your conclusion, your judgment, your evaluation of that situation. And don't be so hasty. You know, some, somebody has spoken something to you. And the first time you hear that vocabulary, you say, how could they use that vocabulary on me? Alright, I'll think about it tomorrow. I'll delay judgment, evaluation, examination, conclusion about that thing tomorrow. And then when tomorrow comes, 
That word doesn't carry the same weight it carried yesterday. That's what the Lord is telling you then. Be not hasty in the spirit to be angry. For anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Anger resteth in the bosom of fools. You hurt yourself more than the people you are angry at. You know, it's like, um, there's no time for me to show you. Vashti was uh, the wife of this king. And the king said, Vashti, let Vashti come on here so that I can see and the people can see her beauty. And Vashti said, no, I'm sorry. I don't want to come to a situation like that for those people who are influenced by drinking to see my beauty. And then the king became angry and told the people, what are we going to do? King, I wish I were there to preach. I wish you attended the Monday Bible study. But I see that you are not at the Bible study. If you had attended Bible study, O King, I would have said, why don't you delay your evaluation of that situation, your judgment until a later time? But you just took an immediate decision and divorced Vashti in Esther chapter 1 by Esther chapter 2 verse 1 his mind went back to Vashti and he wanted her back again but the people of the land said it's too late king once she's gone she's gone that man was an incomplete man for the rest of his life delay the judgment delay the evaluation and delay the conclusion and wait until another time before you bring your conclusion to the thing. It will free you from this kind of turbulent spirit. Ecclesiastes, look at that again. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. I will not be a fool. Tell me out loud. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 13. It says in verse 13. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby ye are sealed. Unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness. And wrath. And anger. And clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. It's saying, picture it in your mind that the bitterness is like an old cloth. You are bigger than that cloth now. The cloth does not fit you anymore. And then it says, the wrath is like an old underwear too tight now makes you look tight and makes you look like you know you're still your old self it says all these old clothes pack them aside and say they don't fit me anymore because of my position now because of my privilege now because of my stature now because of my spiritual personality now those old clothes don't fit me anymore and therefore you pack them and then push them aside don't wear them again let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another you know when you when you have a problem like that if the temptation is coming temptation will still come if the temptation is coming to be angry that's temptation then they literally do something kind something loving and then they will put on a smile and be kind one to another because you see you cannot have a smile and a frown at the same time can you try that now 
a smile and a frown at the same time. And, and you know, whenever you smile, your heart responds. Your heart becomes happy and joyful. And then your brain forgets what you should have been angry about. And so he says, put all this aside and then be kind one to another. And tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you will do it. I said we'll do it. When are you going to do it? Can you rise up then? And just put on kindness. And love. Joy. And happiness. And all those things that you know. Had brought wrath and anger and clamor. In the family. All those things that brought. All those negative negative tempers. In your heart before. Push them aside. And say, Lord, forgive me. Let ego die. And then let Christ live and reign in your heart. Let's pray now. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Are you guilty of murder? Are you guilty of killing? Have you done it before? Is it abortion? Are you guilty of helping other people to take away lives of the unborn babies? It's a great sin. You must repent before the Lord. If you don't repent and have a definite assurance of the forgiveness of God, you will not be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. And not allow anybody to use you to hurt other people, to kill other people, to destroy anybody's life. You know, some people like David, they don't want to do it directly themselves. Don't allow anybody to employ you to do it for them. Thou shalt not kill. And don't allow anybody to make you commit any sin. They want to commit the sin, but they don't want to do it themselves. And so they teach you and train you and beg you and employ you and hire you to do it for them. Don't accept. Be a child of God. If you do it, you are guilty and they are guilty. Don't use occultic means. Don't even be in a cult. And don't use any kind of machinery or any kind of instrument. Whether it's seen or it's not seen. Don't touch lies. Thou shalt not kill. There's judgment, there's wrath on murderers. But you say, Lord, I want to be free. Free from murder, free from abortion. If your daughter gets pregnant and you help her to commit abortion, you're a murderer. You don't have eternal life abiding in you. That daughter does not have salvation. You, the mother, anybody helping her to commit the abortion doesn't have salvation. If you died in that condition, and lady, if while you're committing abortion, you die, that is express way to hellfire. You know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him or in her. Nurse, doctor, don't help them to offend God. Don't help them to sin against God. If you do, you'll be a sinner yourself.
Thou shalt not kill. Jesus is a final judge. And he speaks with royal authority. Thou shalt not kill. Life is precious. Your own life is precious. And the lives of other people are precious too. Thou shalt not kill. The commandment of God has not changed. It has only become greater, higher, broader, wider, and deeper in interpretation. And the Lord is telling us, whosoever is angry with his brother, with his landlord, with his tenant, with the employer, with the employee, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Pray that the Lord will take this fire of anger, even the smoke of anger, hot temper. Pray that the Lord will take it away, set you free. Not only that you will not entertain anger in your own heart or life, you will not be a close, intimate friend to an angry fellow. That fellow will want you, want you to help him revenge on his enemies. When he gets angry and he does not have his way, He'll pour that anger into your life for you to help him. If you love him, he will say, Will you not help me? Just do something against this other fellow I'm angry at. Don't be an intimate friend, a business associate. Or that fellow who's. Um, Anger is taking the better part of him every time. Save your own life. And don't allow any spiritual commitment in ministry with angry fellows. When they get angry, they forget their responsibility. Let them go and settle their temper before they come back. We're not so much in their need of workers that then we forget the Bible standard. And now those people just feel me angry to keep on doing whatever. Let them go and search all their lives and get ready for the kingdom of God. Recognize how dangerous and deadly bad temper is. Repent. Turn away from it and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Renounce it. Reject it. Refuse it. It's no more. Pack all those things aside. The wrath and the anger 
and the bitterness like old clothes you cannot wear again let ego be dead pride be dead then now you submit yourself to the spirit of God cease from anger 